skip to content scoop to site index James B. Comey, the former FBI director. Credit him in winter, the New York Times April 20, 2018 days after the release of his book, A Higher Loyalty, James B. Comey, the former FBI director, was interviewed by Michael Barbaro, the host of the podcast, The Daily, in a wide-ranging conversation, Mr. Comey, who was fired by President Trump last May, talked about his relationship with his former boss, the thinking behind his memos about their interactions, and his struggle with ego. The following is a transcript of the interview from the episode, read highlights of the interview, Michael Barbaro, is everything sounding good? Yep, just maybe tell us about how wonderful that photo experience was outside. James Comey, it was breathtaking, flashing, really. Barbaro, yeah? Laughs, Comey, laughs, I said to you, I've never been videotaped in an elevator before. It's really exciting. Barbaro, we're all multimedia now. Comey, yeah? Yes. Barbaro, so we're gonna jump in. He's sounding good? Great. Thank you again for coming. We really appreciate it. Comey, well, thanks for having me. Barbaro, and welcome to, The Daily, and to The Times. Comey, great to be here. Barbaro, director, I want to start by reading you something that you wrote in the opening pages of your book, actually, in the author's note, right up at the top. You said, all people have flaws, and I have many. Some of mine, as you'll discover in this book, are that I can be stubborn, prideful, overconfident and driven by ego. I've struggled with those my whole life. What compelled you to open your book by noting your flaws? Comey, I think one of the challenges I think I've faced in writing this book is a lot of people already have a view of me that is formed. And there's all kinds of narrative streams as to why I'm a jerk, but one of the narrative streams about why I'm a jerk is, you know, he's a showboater, he's an egomaniac. And, in part, I wanted to hit that head on at the beginning, and be transparent with people about how I think about it, and then talk about how I've tried to deal with it. Barbaro, but you confronted that, in a sense, by saying it's kind of true, the ego question. Comey, yeah? I guess that's right. Although I don't think I was thinking about confronting it so much as making sure that I am, because I think that's an important part of who I am as a leader, not just as a person, because so much of what I've tried to do as a leader is guardrail around what I think my weaknesses are. Really important to me that I avoid the danger, which I think all humans have, but I know I have, of falling in love with my own view of things my own righteousness, and so I really think it was a prelude, and maybe unconsciously but not explicitly or consciously, a reaction to some of the criticism, if that makes sense. Barbaro, it does. As you've been reflecting on the experiences of the past 18 months, in writing this book and processing everything that happened, can you give me an example of a moment where you were driven by ego, as the phrase you used, in your relationship with President Trump? Comey, um, I don't know that I can identify one with President Trump. Associate a couple of small mistakes I think I made in the Clinton email investigation with, I'm not certain of this, but, a risk of ego. I don't consciously associate any of my encounters with, President Trump with an ego weakness on my part. Barbaro, and how about the Clinton one? Comey, well, I think that among the screw-ups I think I can identify as one that my children pointed out initially. They called it Seacresting, where I thought that F. Barbaro, Seacresting, as in Ryan Seacrest. Comey, yeah? And I'm not looking to pick on Ryan Seacrest, but my kids take is that Ryan Seacrest was often guilty of this, I'm about to announce this thing, but first, this commercial. And they said, Dad, you, by waiting till the very end of your announcement on July the 5th to say what it is you are going to do, we think you Seacrested it, and, Barbaro, um, kind of publicly tortured people. Comey, yeah? And I kind of brushed that off, and then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, actually, people were confused. What I was thinking was, this is where I re think it's an ego issue, is, I thought I knew best, and that, if I announce the result at the front, nobody will listen to what I say, and what I say about why we were reaching this conclusion and the transparency was essential to people having confidence that we were doing it in an independent way. I think the criticism is actually valid. But the reason I associate it with ego is, I think, I thought I knew the right way to do it, and in hindsight, especially with great feedback from my family, I don't think I did. Barbaro, um, I want to come back to this question of, of you believing you knew the right path, but let's just hold on to that thought. We want to focus a lot of this conversation on the now famous memos that you wrote as FBI director, documenting your interactions with President Trump, and in some cases, President-elect Trump. You've acknowledged that after the president fired you, you asked a friend of yours to share the contents of those memos, or at least one memo, Comey, one of the memos. 
right. Barbaro, with the New York Times, with the explicit intention of triggering a special counsel investigation. So take us back to the beginning. Why did you write the very first memo? I believe it was January 6th. You have just left a meeting at Trump Tower with the president-elect. So what has occurred in that meeting that prompts you to start to put in memorandum form your experience with him? Comey, that meeting had two parts to it. One with other intelligence community leaders present, and then another without them, just myself and the president-elect. Purpose of that second session was for me to brief the president-elect on some salacious material, an allegation that the Russians had compromising material of a sexual nature on the president-elect. Barbaro, this is the dossier. Comey, right. A portion of the dossier, the so-called dossier, that related to his conduct. And the goal of the conversation was twofold. First, to alert him to materials that we were aware of, the intelligence community, that we thought were about to become public, and we were right. And second, in the event there was something to it, one of the things the FBI does in its counterintelligence role is try to do a defensive briefing. That is, if someone is possibly subject to any kind of coercion or blackmail, you tell them, look, we know about this, which makes it less likely that an adversary will be able to utilize that information. Barbaro, but my understanding is that you had never kept memos in this way before, and you have served several presidents. Comey, correct. I don't remember ever writing a memo about a communication with a president or any other senior official. I, I don't. I never created a memo of an encounter with the president. Barbaro, so there's something inherent in this president that's different, it sounds like. Comey, oh, yes. Barbaro, and is dishonesty, in your mind, the core? Comey, the core concern for memo creation? Sure. The notion that the truth and integrity were not, his track record, at least so far as I could see, was not one where they were high values in his life. Barbaro, um hum. And so the memos are, in a sense, a protective measure in this power dynamic. Comey, well, a protective measure in the life of the FBI, and to protect the organization. I was having a conversation with the president or president-elect that touched on the FBI's core responsibilities, and that involved the president or president-elect personally, so they weren't about policy questions or things like that, but they were about personal issues. And I worried that, given the nature of the person I was talking to, if it ever became an issue, he might well lie about the content of that communication. And so I needed to have a written record so I could remember it clearly to protect the FBI, and also to protect myself. Barbaro, right, because with two people in the room, there's just two possible accounts. Comey, correct. Barbaro, not a third. Nobody verifying anything. Comey, unless there's a tape. Barbaro, we'll get to that. What did you do with the first memo after you wrote it? Comey, I can't say. That was it, Barbaro. Okay Comey, detail that the FBI asked me to take out of the book. Barbaro, um, Comey, and so I can't say. Barbaro, okay so when was the next time that you wrote a memo about your interaction with the president? Comey, I think the next one was the dinner on Friday night, the 27th of January, 2017, Barbaro, at the White House. Comey, correct. Barbaro, and this is an encounter in which, as I recall, the president asks you for something, something quite valuable to him. Comey, correct. He asked me for loyalty at the beginning and then again at the end of the dinner, near the end of the dinner. Barbaro, and so how exactly does this work? You leave the White House. I assume you get into a government SUV, Comey, of her. Barbaro, and how does the memo writing actually unfold? Comey, my recollection is that I did it that night as soon as I got home on my personal laptop and printed it out on my printer. Created two copies, initialed them both. These weren't on letterhead, because these were personal aid memoirs. Barbaro, so you were printing them out and signing them. Comey, correct. Initialing them. I think I just initialed and dated them, printed it out, and put a copy in my personal safe at home, and took another copy to the FBI. The next workday and had my chief of staff hold it. One stored at the FBI, one stored at my home. Barbaro, at this point, now that the president has behaved in a way that you find problematic, seriously problematic, are you starting to think about what these memos might be for a little bit differently? Not just traditional record keeping, not just an account in case it's needed. And I ask that because you're writing them in a way, as I understand it, that's unclassified, which suggests that you might have thought that someday they might, for one reason or another, become public. Comey, well, I don't think I thought about that at that point. I wrote it that way because you can't store classified information, although your personal safe is secure, it's supposed to be stored in a government safe. 
it's classified, and so I wanted to be sure that I was storing it appropriately. Barbaro, right, given, especially, the investigation you had just been involved in. Comey, of course, and even if there wasn't, it's something that is drilled into you when you go into the government, especially in an FBI role, and so this is about in the event it's ever needed to protect the FBI and myself. Barbaro, but are you starting to imagine a world in which the behavior you're documenting in the memos might need to be shared more broadly? Comey, I don't think so at that point. Barbaro, um um. Comey, I don't think I was contemplating that future, and my hope was that I would never need the memo. Barbaro, that it would just remain hidden. Comey, correct. Barbaro, so then the third memo, and the last one I'm going to ask you about, is about this other moment we've all heard about, February 14th, Valentine's Day. The president is in the White House. He's in the Oval Office. You're in there for a meeting. And one by one, the president asks the vice president, and then the attorney general, to leave the Oval Office, and essentially asks you once you're alone if you would consider dropping the investigation into Michael Flynn. Right. Comey, well, if you would consider, makes it sound more of a question than a direction. He said I hope we would let it go. So yes, that was February 14th, at the end of a meeting that was called for a counterterrorism briefing. Barbaro, and so you walk out of that meeting, and once again, it feels like, at this point, there's a little bit of a system and a threshold in your head. This meeting merits a memo. Comey, I think that's right. And by this point, I'd had sort of a sense of when I needed to document something, and so this one clearly needed to be documented. And I remember emailing my staff, because I was headed home. It was Valentine's Day, and one doesn't always go home on Valentine's Day, but I'm married and deeply in love with my wife, and so I needed to get home for Valentine's Day. Barbaro, right, Comey, and I remember emailing my staff that the meeting had gone fine, but now I need to write another memo. Barbaro, so your staff knows what you mean when you say, I need to write another memo. Comey, yes, Barbaro, they get it. Comey, yeah? Barbaro, in your account of that February 14th meeting in the Oval Office, in which the President asks you, says he hopes that you can let the Flynn matter go, you said in your book that you had no choice but to stay in the Oval Office alone with the President, those are the words you used, when he asked these other people in the room to leave, one by one. And I wonder why you didn't have a choice? We talked a little earlier about power dynamics, but you are, at this point, the director of the FBI, you are a profoundly distinguished lawman, you're an independent operator, and you are, by your own description, stubborn and prideful. So why do you have to stay? Why do you have no choice in the matter to be alone with the president in the Oval Office? Comey, I don't suppose there's literally no choice. I mean, I was not handcuffed to a chair. But given that I am the director of the FBI, and the President of the United States has, in essence, issued an order for the room to be cleared and me to stay, it never entered my mind to walk out. Just because of my respect for the office, the literal physical office in which I stood, and the office of the President of the United States, I, I can't imagine, many things people can second-guess, but walking out at that moment I don't think is one that could be fairly second-guessed. Barbaro, but I guess what I'm getting at is why, at this point, as FBI, Director, aren't you doing anything more meaningful about these encounters than memorializing them in a memo? If they're becoming troubling to you, as I think you're suggesting they very much are, why are you just writing these stories down and locking them away, even if there are two copies, one at the FBI, one at home, and hoping, as you said, that they never end up having to be seen? Comey, well, I'm doing more than that, I think, including, in the course of the dinner with the president on the 27th, trying to interject, to explain to him why it's important for there to be distance between the president and the Justice Department, and why I was there a week earlier, about a week earlier, February the 8th, talking to his chief of staff, and part of that conversation was about the appropriate channels for communicating with the FBI Barbaro, but, as I recall, that meeting with Reigns Priebus ends with him, in your mind, inappropriately guiding you over to the president once more, to have a conversation you didn't even really want to have, but you had it. Comey, yup. And then the day after the Valentine's Day conversation, I spoke to the Attorney General, my direct boss, and told him, it can't happen that you're kicked out of a room and the president meets with me. You have to be between me and the president. Barbaro, but you chose not to tell the attorney general about what the president had asked of you, which was to drop the Flynn investigation. Comey, correct. Barbaro, that was a conscious decision not to tell. Comey, yup. Absolutely. Because we believed that was something we had discussed, the FBI senior leadership team, that he was shortly going to be recused or stepped away from anything related to Russia. Barbaro, but why not tell the AG? 
it just seems like the most natural thing to tell your boss. Comey, well, for that reason. We, we thought, Barbaro, that he would, that he wasn't going to be doing it much longer. Or is it a little more fundamental that you might not have trusted him? Comey, no, I don't think it was that. He was so new at that point. I think he'd only been there a week or so, and he was, as a legal matter, going to be walled off from anything related to this, and so why would we hand him something when there's already been a conclusion, and we had heard this from career officials inside the Justice Department, that he was going to be walled off? So it wouldn't make any sense to hand him this, and then he'd have to be on the other side of a wall. Barbaro, well, just forgive me for a second, though. But if, if I know my boss, who's just outside this room, is about to not be my boss, I think I'm still going to tell him about a pressing matter that feels deeply inappropriate, something that's occurred in my work, even if he's not going to be in that job for that much longer, right? The sort of chain of command seems important. Comey, yeah? It didn't feel that way to us. We couldn't think in the immediate moment about a way to corroborate it. So what do we do with this? Barbaro, because it's just the two of you. Comey, it's just the two of us. And so the decision that we made as a team was we'll keep it in a metaphorical box so it doesn't infect the investigative team, and we'll hold it close. And we won't share it with the Attorney General, because he will be shortly, we think, out of anything related to Russia, and we'll figure out what to do with it down the road. Barbaro, looking back now, do you, do you think that was the right decision? Comey, I do. Barbaro, and why? Comey, for the reasons I just said. I, I don't think it would make sense to be briefing the Attorney General on a matter that directly related to the subject from which he would be shortly recused. Barbaro, okay Comey, and especially because there was nothing for him to do. The important thing, something he could do, is to understand my discomfort with being alone with the President and the importance of staying between me and the President. Barbaro, and do you think that registered with him? Comey, I guess, registered in what sense? Barbaro, do you think that Attorney General Sessions absorbed your discomfort with being alone with the President and acted on it in such a way that it might not recur? Comey, no. The first part, yes. I think he clearly understood, and I asked my Chief of Staff to call his afterwards just to make sure he understood. Whether he could or would do anything to maintain that separation? I didn't see any evidence of that. Barbaro, um um. So, in all, how many memos do you think that you ended up writing about your conversations with the President? Comey, I don't remember, exactly. It's somewhere between 5 and 10, Barbaro, um um. Comey, yeah? I don't know, because I don't have them. But it's, it's more than 5, and it's less than 10, Barbaro, got it. And you don't have them because they have been taken from you. Comey, oh, I turned them over to the FBI, at their request. Barbaro, okay so then you are, in fact, fired by the president, Comey, so I've heard. Barbaro, though I know the Chiron that you see first says resigned, which must have surprised you, because you did not resign. You were, in fact, fired in May of 2017, and at some point not long after that, we now all know, you decided you wanted these memos out in the world. What happened to finally set that decision into motion? me, a middle of the night, which almost never happens to me, because I'm a sound sleeper, but a middle of the night lightning bolt revelation, delayed revelation. I was fired on a Tuesday. The next few days after my firing, there were articles that appeared in various newspapers, where it appeared, Barbaro, I believe the Times, in particular, had a story about Comey, yeah, I think the Times. And I don't know whether anybody else, but it appeared that, Barbaro, about the loyalty dinner. Comey, yeah, about loyalty, and it was something else too. I can't remember what it was. But that gave the president, apparently, cause to believe that I was talking to the media, which I was not. And he tweeted, on Friday after I was fired, so, three days later, and I may have this wrong, but James Comey better hope there aren't tapes before he starts leaking to the media, Barbaro, um um. Comey, and I didn't focus on that right away because I was in this place where I was trying to keep all of this out of my head. Barbaro, um um, Comey, so, I don't remember thinking about it until I woke up in the middle of the night Monday night, so into early Tuesday morning. I think it was 2 o'clock in the morning. I opened my eyes in bed and thought, wait a minute, if there are tapes, there will be corroboration. It won't be my word against the presidents, which was the problem we encountered to begin with. If there are tapes, he will be heard on those tapes saying what I recorded him saying in my memo. Someone's gotta go get those tapes. And lying there in bed, I thought, the FBI. We'll see what I see. They probably saw it days before, I don't know. Barbaro, right. He has 50 million Twitter followers. Comey, right. 
but I mean not just see it, but realize the significance of it in connection with the Valentine's Day meeting particularly. And at that point, my conclusion was, I can trust the FBI to see it and to want to go get those tapes. But I honestly didn't trust the leadership of the Department of Justice to pursue it aggressively. And so I thought, something's got to be done to force them to go get the tapes from the Oval Office, and it's going to take a special prosecutor to pursue those. If I put out in the public square, the February 14th, the substance of it, it will be clear the significance of the President's tweet about tapes and it will force something that otherwise wouldn't happen. And I thought, well, I'm a private citizen now, that information is unclassified, and so I will ask a friend of mine to get it out into the media. Borrow, right. So it was the mention of the tapes by the president in this tweet that first planted this idea that if I release these memos, I'll trigger the special counsel and will get the tapes. Comey, correct. Barbaro, okay. And do you believe that you triggered the special counsel? Comey, I don't know. I don't. Again, because I don't have any visibility into what the FBI was doing. For all I know, and I'm just making this up, the FBI had already sent a memo over saying, we believe there ought to be a special counsel appointed. That's possible. And so I may have had no role. But that's why I say I don't know. Baro, so do you believe that, it would have happened eventually no matter what? Comey, I don't know. You can make an argument it would be likely that it would happen regardless. But I, Barbaro, the chronology is kind of powerful. Comey, it is, but Barbaro, in terms of timing, your contribution to it. Comey, yeah, I mean, look, that's why I say I think it's possible that I was either a factor or the determining factor. Barbaro, um um. You have told the story a few times about waking up in the middle of the night with this realization that if there are tapes, they might back up the accounts that you have been documenting in these memos. But I have to say, in hearing that and reading it in the book, and forgive me, the notion that the president had a secret recording of this conversation at the White House has always struck me as implausible, and something he just was saying because he was angry and he didn't like the fact that you were out there communicating your side. Did you really believe that he had tapes? Comey, certainly not for certain. But I thought there was a real prospect, given his tweet, that he did. And someone needed to go find out. Barbaro, but ultimately, was it more important to you that there be a special counsel investigation than that there be a way of getting the tapes? Comey, no, I don't think more important. I mean, what, what I woke up thinking about was the tapes, getting the tapes. Someone's gotta go get the tapes. Barbaro, um um is another possible explanation that the president had just fired you, which is a pretty traumatic experience and one that would be pretty difficult on anybody, and you knew these memos would cause him a lot of trouble, and you sincerely wanted the public to see them. Comey, no. I mean, it's possible somebody else would have thought that, and maybe that's a more noble way of thinking about it, but I wasn't thinking in terms of broader public interest or any of those things at the time. Barbaro, so, your plan, again, is release the memos, get a special counsel, get the special counsel to go get tapes, Comey, I'm sorry to keep interrupting you. Memo. Barbaro, memo. Comey, a lot of people have been talking about memos. Single, in classified memo. Barbaro, yep. So the plan is to, is to release a memo, get a special counsel, have the special counsel hopefully get the tapes. That plan feels pretty complicated and elaborate in terms of steps and moves and pieces. Could there have been a simpler way? Comey, um, I don't know. Maybe you want to suggest one, but that's what I thought of at 2 o'clock in the morning. Is that that would put pressure on, force the Department of Justice to do what had been talked about in the media that they were considering doing. Barbaro, right. Because you didn't trust the Department of Justice to do the right thing on its own. Comey, correct. Barbaro, you said perhaps there's a suggestion. The simplest solution might be just to go to the FBI or the Department of Justice and say, you should ask for those tapes. Me, yeah, but the FBI already knows what I know, and so if I can be useful, it's in putting pressure on the Department of Justice leadership, not the FBI. But given that I lacked confidence in the leadership of the Department of Justice, going to the FBI would be telling them something they already knew. But Barbaro, but, let's focus on the Department of Justice. I mean, isn't it a sign that there's something fundamentally broken when the former director of the FBI doesn't trust the Department of Justice or think it's capable of doing its job? Comey, sure. Barbaro, that you essentially felt you needed to work around this agency full of law enforcement officials to deal with a situation that, ideally, they would deal with on a routine basis. Comey, right. It is filled with law enforcement officials, but it's led by individual human beings. 
and I knew the Attorney General was recused, and given how I thought the Deputy Attorney General had handled my firing, I did not have confidence that it would be done in the right way. Barbaro, um, this is Rod Rosenstein. Comey, correct. Barbaro, that does feel like a sad state of affairs. Comey, oh, sure. There's a whole lot of, lot of sad states of affairs over the last couple of years. But yeah, sure. It's regrettable. Barbaro, you write about this in your book. You say about your thinking at the time, I could leave it alone. I trust the system to work. But you decided in the end that you, as we've just established, that you didn't trust the system, and you were going to do things your own way. And that calls to mind some of the words you use to describe yourself in the book, in the author's note, overconfident, stubborn, driven by ego. What do you think? Comey, yeah, I don't think that's fair. Barbaro, okay Comey, yeah? Barbaro, why not? Comey, because I, I don't think ego, stubbornness, overconfidence played a significant role in those decisions. Those are things I always ask myself when I make decisions. But I thought I was quite logical and practical in trying to do something I thought was in the public interest, in the interest of the Justice Department. Barbaro, um, um I want to ask you about this because it, it feels, and please feel free to interrupt me if you think I'm mistaken here, that we're seeing a recurring pattern a bit here, in which you lack faith in the system to work through the kind of official normal functions. And let me give you a couple of examples of where it seems you decide it's important and right to take matters into your own hands, you felt during the Clinton investigation that you could not entirely trust the Department of Justice under Loretta Lynch to handle that probe of the private email server, which prompted you to take it upon yourself to make a pretty unusual, Comey, I disagree with your, you want me to interrupt already? I disagree with your predication. You wanna keep going? Barbaro, I think so. Yes, Comey, okay keep rolling, keep rolling. Barbaro, object at the end. Comey, keep going. Barbaro, so, Comey, objection withdrawn. Barbaro, laughs, so this concern about Loretta Lynch and her role prompts you to take it upon yourself to make this very unusual public pronouncement about Hillary Clinton's use of email. And then after that investigation was closed, but new information surfaces because of what happened with Anthony Weiner, and there are new emails, you decided that that needed to be made public even though it was a, a pretty significant break with precedent to do that so close to an election. And then, of course, in this case with President Trump, you decide to make public your conversations with him through the media to trigger a special counsel investigation. So please feel free to object if you, if you don't see a pattern there of you deciding, Comey, I don't. I see you drawing a line, respectfully as they say in court, through three dots that I would treat differently. First, I would point out the context. What's different about the memo disclosure is that's a decision I'm making on my own. The decisions in the late spring, early summer of 2016 and then again in October is a decision I'm making with a group of smart, thoughtful people debating it constantly to try to get to the right result. And there are different circumstances. The first circumstance is not about not trusting the Department of Justice, but it's about caring deeply about how the Department of Justice, Barbaro, is perceived. Comey, exactly. And in light of circumstances that are beyond my control, finding a situation where the FBI, I and the rest of our team thinks, to protect the institutions, we have to do something unusual. Not that I don't like Loretta Lynch, not that I don't respect Loretta Lynch. But circumstances have created a situation where, if we do the normal thing, corrosive damage will happen in the life of these institutions we love. October is very different. It's not about the institutions and not being able to deal effectively with a particular leader, or, it's about, we're facing a choice. We have to.